Um, so without further delay, I will um, hand this off to our moderator, Christina Schiedel. Thank you, Kate, and welcome everyone to the Carbon Offset Panel. I, I'm not sure where all of the four panelists are here yet, so I hope they will join at least uh, later in the discussion. My name is Christina Schadel. I'm a research faculty at the Center of Ecosystem Science and Society here at Northern Arizona University. And uh, I have been leading the carbon offset program for ECOS, which covers air travel for students, faculty, and staff for the last two years. And uh, I guess that's why I was chosen to moderate this panel. Um, I'd like to welcome all of the panelists and uh, I would suggest that we go around the virtual room and everyone introduces themselves and mentions briefly what your university is doing in re regard to carbon offsets. And uh, I would like to start with uh, Matthew Arsenal. Can you start talking about your university and briefly introduce yourself as well, please? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Christina and Kate. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Matthew Arsenal. I am the program manager of the Duke University Carbon Offsets Initiative. Um, so, you know, in addition to our central sustainability staff that are focusing more on uh, on-campus emission reductions as well as a host of other things, we have the Carbon Offsets Initiative, a two-person office uh, within the sustainability office. We are focusing on off-campus emission reductions, and so our office was created in 2009. Uh, I've been here at the office since uh, 2017, and so we basically generate carbon offsets uh, through developing our own projects for Duke University, and we're also tasked with uh, developing the offset purchasing strategy and then uh, sometime soon executing those purchases on behalf of the university on our way to our 2024 carbon neutrality goal. Thanks again for having me. Thank you. Next, I'd like to invite Dave Newport to introduce yourself and talk about your university's efforts. Thank you, Christina, and uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's an honor to sit on such an esteemed panel and talk about something that is near and dear to my heart when I'm not cursing the whole idea of offsets. Uh, so Dave Newport, I'm the director of the Environmental Center at the University of Colorado Boulder, came here 15, 15 something years ago. Uh, from the University of Florida, where we started the uh, sustainability program there in the 90s, got that running, uh, working for, uh, directly for the president. And uh, at Sea Boulder, we, uh, at the Environmental Center, just turned 50 years old, so uh, honored to uh, be associated with the oldest uh, panel, uh, oldest organization of its kind in the country. Uh, part of what we do is um, uh, purchase offsets for select units and purposes around campus. And uh, those purposes include um, all the offsets to compensate for the emissions from uh, student government related facilities, which are the three biggest buildings on campus. I'm sorry, now down to two of the biggest buildings on campus, the student union and the recreation center. Uh, as student government is sort of autonomous at CU Boulder and has its own funding and so forth. And, uh, likewise, we offset all of the scopes one and two uh, emissions for the athletics program. Um, CU Athletics leader in sports sustainability for 12 years now um, is carbon neutral on scopes one and two and actually net positive uh, energy as a result of a new facility they built. <clears throat> we also offset um, for conference service, um, conference services on those uh, events that uh, generate that sort of revenue. And to the credit of our many IPCC climate scientists uh, in our research institutes at CU Boulder, uh, we also the travel of those scientists uh, to professional organization meetings and so forth and so on. So that at least our climate scientists can say they're carbon neutral and, um, and work in lead platinum uh, research buildings and so forth. Um, but we do not offset the entire emissions of the university, uh, working on alternative strategies for that. Okay, thank you. Can you briefly say what scope one and scope two mean? Sure, scope one uh, emissions are the result of um, the combustion of fuels that you own and directly control. 
gas, uh, gas in your car is the easiest example. You buy that gas and you burn it at, under your direct control and it turns into carbon dioxide and water and goes up in the atmosphere. So scope one is very easy to control. Um, and the criteria is ownership and control. Scopes two carbon um, <clears throat> are emissions resulting from the combustion of fuels. Generally, I'm saying combustion of fuels is the biggest source um, that you may not own, but you more or less directly control. And the light switch on your wall, if you're plugged into a municipal utility or something, is a expositive of that. Um, you don't own the carbon, the utility buys it because you ask to be served by them. And so theoretically, you have direct proportionality for every time you flick on the light switch or turn on your electric oven or whatever, they release emissions basically to serve your needs. Scope three is everything else, and it's a mess. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into that. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's the short story on scopes one and two. Great. Thank you very much for clarifying this. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Mick from uh, Arizona State University. Introduce yourself. Thank you. Very happy to be here and see everybody again. Uh, so Arizona State University, we uh, we generate. We started uh, a a community bundles tree planting project that Duke actually helped us out with in the very beginning through the Duke carbon offset protocols. Um, and so we actually do tree plantings and then combined with uh, market offsets. So that's one source uh, of carbon offsets. Uh, then another source is right now, actually, uh, in a partnership with Northern Arizona University, uh, we are planting as we speak um, an urban forest on our West Campus. It's a thousand native trees. Um, and there's probably about a tree 700 right now and they'll be finished tomorrow. Uh, so that's going to be both a research project and a carbon sink that will generate offsets for us. Um, and then we also buy market offsets. Uh, we went to carbon neutral in fiscal year 19. And so we do have scope one emissions uh, related to our uh, combined heat and power plant that we have not figured out a solution for yet. Uh, and so those, uh, those offsets uh, are, so, sorry, we go out and we buy market offsets uh, to, to cover for that. Although this year, what we'll do is we'll actually use the offsets we've acquired through the urban forestry program um, and retire them. We've been banking them and we'll retire them against our scope one emissions. And we have, uh, we do have a price on carbon for our air travel. And that's what generates the revenue that pays for those community bundles. Okay, thank you. Very different approach than what I've heard from the other um, panelists. Uh, and our last panelist, Ian Johnson, please introduce yourself. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ian Johnson. Uh, you see him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm the Director of Sustainability at Colorado College. Um, we are a smallish uh, private liberal arts college in, in Colorado Springs on the, on the front range. Um, we we are, are using um, both renewable energy certificates as well as, as carbon offsets. Um, we, we set a goal in 2009 uh, to achieve carbon neutrality by 2020 and as of January 1st of this year uh, achieve that goal um, and, and carbon offsets were a distinct part of the, the strategy that we used. Um, we, we also did um, what I consider the hard work of, of reducing emissions you know, drastically uh, ahead of time um, by, by about 75% um, and then some of the other emissions that remain that some of the other panelists have, have uh, have referred to, um, we're, we're using carbon offsets um, also to, to uh, account for those. And we see that as a, uh, as a both legitimate and necessary strategy. And part of our role in higher ed is, uh, we believe is, is to help um, develop those markets and, and participate in as early adopters in some cases in the, the project development and market development and recognition of that as, as a legitimate strategy that is um, removing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere in other places, um, in some cases as a as a uh, um, as a stopgap measure, and in, in many cases as a necessary part of, of a global solution. And so, I'll be very happy to get into details of that as, as we get into questions about about all of this. Great, thank you all so much. I would like to invite the audience. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box so that we can uh, ask the panelists. What, what you are curious about. 
we have thought of some questions in advance. And uh, one thing that I am often curious about myself is how confident are you that the offsets you have purchased are having the desired effect of reducing net emissions? It's something that if I communicate with someone who doesn't know anything about carbon offsets, I often get asked that question and then I'm a little bit, it's a tricky one. So I, I'm not sure who of you would like to take the question, but uh, yeah, I'd be curious. What do you think? Maybe Dave, yeah. Well, and I'm happy to thank you. I'm happy to talk about um, an offsets program we've been uh, using for the last few years. It's actually very close to NAU as well and um, uh, feel very confident about it. We um, invest in that program through Native Energy. So one of the oldest, most respected uh, offset provider in the United States. And the, uh, the program is a uh, the recovery of naturally occurring methane emissions leaking from geological cracks in the ground uh, on the tribal lands of the Southern Ute Nation in Durango, Colorado. So close to all y'all and NAU and ASU and so forth. Um, and, and, and importantly, um, has a social justice component to it that we're very um, happy about. And, and obviously as a Colorado institution, um, we want to keep our revenue, or I'm sorry, our uh, offset dollars uh, close to home with maximum amount of social uh, deliverables from that. Uh, that said, um, it's easy to envision this project. I love it because without this program, those missions would simply be going into the air as methane, period. And basically it's a big vacuum cleaner for want of a better descriptor, um, hooking up to these cracks, it recovers that methane, um, pumps it into a passing natural gas pipeline. There's a meter. We can know exactly how much methane is going by. It gets um, dumped into the natural gas pipeline. It gets ultimately burned, but that, of course, conversion, Christina, as you know, uh, converts it from uh, methane to CO2 and, and far less uh, impact for uh, climate change and so forth. Still an impact, but mm, at least 26 times less than uh, would be as methane plus, at least theoretically, um, you can consider that uh, the provision of this uh, fuel from these natural occurring vents displaces the equivalent amount of uh, natural gas being extracted from a uh, well. I'm not sure that that's practical, but it's nice to think about. And, uh, but it's definitely practical to, you know, see how much methane is going by and how many BTUs went into that pipeline. That we know with certainty. So I love offsets that are additional. And the key word here is additional. That would not have happened if had this investment not been made to recover that. And I think that's the key component in my book for the quality of an offset is whether or not it would have not happened had you not invested in it. I think that's a key argument. Thank you for bringing that up, the additional offset. Um, yeah, Matt, Ian, would you like to contribute to this as well or? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I, I think, you know, like, like Dave, uh, the, the project that we've, uh, that we've used to date um, is fairly easily quantifiable. Um, the, the, the sole project that we're, that we're sourcing um, carbon offsets from, uh, we have a separate project that, that we're, um, that we've that we've worked with um, for renewable energy certificates, but uh, and those things are are similar but but different mechanisms. Um, the the project that we are are engaged with right now is uh, the Larimer County landfill gas destruction project. And so, like the the project that that Dave is talking about, this one is specifically um, vacuuming up very very well put, Dave, vacuuming up methane that was otherwise entering the atmosphere. Um, and so. Um, we, we can easily quantify, you know, how much of that is, is being converted and would have gone into the atmosphere as methane. We know that it's, as Dave said, 20, between 26 and 28, depending on which assessment report we're using, times uh, the, the, the uh, potency of CO2. And so we can very easily quantify that impact on, uh, on global warming or climate change uh, forcings. Um, the other, the other pieces I, that, that Dave mentioned, I think, are also pieces that were really critical to us and things that um, are more difficult to quantify, but really were important. The other co-benefits, um, uh, whether they're social, um, environmental, uh, air quality benefits, job creation, and, and we had a strong preference 
um, to, uh, to uh, particularly, you know, as exhibited from uh, our students, to, to do something local, um, which in particularly in our students' eyes, um, those, those benefits are easier to, to quantify and easier to, to see um, when, they're, when they're local. I think there's, there's certainly merit in um, some of the farther reaching projects, but it's, it's much more easy for our students, particularly and, and probably many, if not most people to, to understand um, and see some of those co-benefits when they're, when they're happening close to home as well. Um, and the other piece of this that I would say that, that is you know, easy, uh, relatively easy for us to see um, is, is that, that piece that I mentioned earlier, the market development piece. And so the project that we're, um, that we're engaged with uh, through Three Degrees, uh, the, the president and CEO of, of Three Degrees happens to be uh, conveniently a, a CC alum. Um, and so we have a, a special relationship that we were able to um, go down that road and, and really help with uh, the, the development and certification of this specific project. It was at its recertification stage. And at the point that we stepped in and said, we need, we need something in, in a volume that can satisfy our needs. Um, this project was also looking for that investor. And so we were able to create that relationship then that, that pushed that project forward. And so that was part of the market development and uh, uh, what, I would, what I would call early adopter or in, in, you know, uh, investor risk of sorts uh, to step in and help that project move forward as well. Interesting, thank you. Yeah, Dave, go ahead. Just, yeah, just a quick glib comment here. So we've also invested in that project and, and uh, uh, enjoy savoring the irony that that project is helping our uh, erstwhile rivals at Colorado State University lower their carbon emissions. Uh, and they're doing a really great job in beating our pants off on stars ratings and so forth. And But we're contributing to their success and happy to do so. Thank you. Mick, can you say something about the local carbon offset aspect and the co-benefits, given that you just mentioned the tree planting in Arizona? I'm curious about, for example, water usage, because trees don't naturally grow so much in Phoenix, I believe. Could you address this? Sure. Yeah. And, you know, as, as Ian kind of mentioned, our dream, well, actually, our dream is to not need offsets. Uh, but given that, you know, energy reductions, there are, at some point you, you reach a financial um, balance that you need to be looking at. Could I do more for the planet? You know, the atmosphere is across the entire planet. Could I do more to remove, remove emissions or reduce emissions uh, in the atmosphere on campus or off campus? And our preference is always to try and invest our money on campus uh, but at some point, the, the financial aspects, it, make, you make it, it makes you realize you could do more off. Uh, but if we're going to do anything off, then, then, uh, then trying to tie it to the research, the education, and the community embedded as missions of the university, um, that, that's, a, uh, that's a home run. Um, and so the tree plantings have lots of co-benefits. We do get numerous uh, local organizations involved in helping plant the trees. We work with the cities. So it's actually the cities that own these trees. The cities contract to maintain them for 20 years. So they're in public rights of way. So we're helping the cities implement their tree and shade master plans. We're using native species uh, or desert adapted species to minimize water use. Uh, but trees are a much more efficient way to cool the city than uh, grasses, you know, in terms of water usage. Uh, and so we actually, I'm tying it to the research side in this carbon sink, we have two different research centers that are involved in the project. One of them is uh, measuring the microclimate both before the forest and then as the forest grows to understand what the, the, the actual microclimate benefits are. And then a second research group is actually gonna be doing uh, carbon testing of the soil to see how much uh, carbon is being injected into the soil. Uh, and so uh, we're, we're hoping to, to find all that out. So, uh, you know, one of the questions we have is, you know, these desert trees, they don't always grow uh, as tall and they're certainly not as fast growing as some in other forests. So how much carbon are they storing how quickly and how much are they injecting into the soil? So that's part of this research project as well. So it's, it's, uh, it's got a lot of different co-benefits. And we, we actually built the system out there to just have irrigation as a starter. 
Um, so we don't plan on using irrigation after the first year, um, just based on rainfall. But being that we've had almost no rain this entire year, I'm a little bit nervous about uh, what the rain patterns in the future are going to be and whether we're going to have to supplement this forest with water. Okay. Uh, 20 years seems short for me for a forest offset project. What, what, why is the 20 year time frame chosen? Um, they had to come up with some kind of a contractual uh, term that would be, you know, trying to enter into like a 50 year contract with a city you know, would be kind of tough. So 20 years, um, the, the carbon that we're accruing for that will accrue for those 20 years and then they'll be at maturity. Um, and, you know, at that point, maybe we'll figure something out contractually to, to continue that on, but, you know, had to have some kind of finite time period um, that made the numbers work, uh, but also did not obligate the city forever. You know, cities change over time, and so they may need to change a right away or move a park or something like that. And um, so a 20-year term seems something that was doable. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Matthew, maybe you can answer this question. Uh, as Nick was just saying earlier, the dream would be to not use any offsets. How do you feel about that? And is your offset program just an intermediary step and you will eventually move away from that? Or do you plan on using offsets for the next, for the foreseeable future? Yeah, so I guess the end goal or the uh, long-term goal is to work myself out of a job. Um, that's probably what's best for the university. And that's probably the way that offsets should be used is um, not as a silver bullet towards uh, sustainability, because as, as other panelists have mentioned, uh, on-campus emissions should be uh, the, the first and foremost focus as far as um, effort and dollars put towards um, uh, emissions reductions. Uh, but yeah, so at Duke, we, we definitely see things through a uh, reduce, renew, offset paradigm where we are looking at on-campus uh, reductions to the extent possible. We've achieved 34% uh, uh, emission reductions from our 2007 baseline year as the campus has grown by hundreds of thousands of square feet. Um, and we have recently made some investments in renewable energy in the form of uh, solar capacity, about 100 megawatts of solar capacity through three facilities that are going to be coming online in North Carolina. And we're also looking at purchasing some renewable biogas to displace our natural gas use on campus. So all of these uh, are happening in the order that we're comfortable with, looking at on campus, looking at renewable energy, and only then uh, looking at what remains in our greenhouse gas accounting and using offsets towards those. The ultimate goal is that the amount of offsets we'll need goes down over time to the point where we don't need any. Um, so that's, you know, that's our plan thus far. That's what we're working towards. And um, yeah, I mean, just start looking for a new job here in the next several years. But uh, I think we've got a lot of work to do before then. What's the time frame you're thinking of finding a new job? Uh, that's a great question. We'll definitely need offsets for the uh, near term, at least. We're going to need our projections right now for our 2024 carbon neutrality goal are roughly 75,000 to 82,000 offsets needed in 2024. Um, and you can imagine that slowly decreasing over time unless there's some uh, big shocks as far as our on-campus emission reductions are concerned. So it's hard to model, uh, hard to account for those or hard to predict those big shocks, but um, uh, hopefully over the next decade or so, those amount of offsets needed will go down on a, on a couple year rolling average. And uh, maybe when we reevaluate here in five or seven years, we can really have a great answer to your question. For, for now, we're definitely gonna need offsets in the near future. Yeah, that's what I would expect. Thank you. Uh, we have an audience question that I would like to ask you. Have any of you used carbon offsets as incentive? So instead of a department paying to give a reusable water bottle or gift card to student volunteers, the department could reward participation in activities with offsets for the university. Has either of you, your university considered this? Not sure who I should ask because well, I don't know. I'll say, okay. uh, we have we have not uh, considered this. Um, we we tend to be very low on on the the, the handouts and the swag, um, and and we have other incentives um, that we use, particularly for trying to solicit surveys and things like that. But this is uh, 
duly noted, this is this is probably something that uh, that we could be using as an incentive. Yeah. Yeah, also we've used offsets more as um, a marketing tool than an incentive. So, um, you know, we have uh, an annual energy week on campus and they have uh, used our offsets to make their entire um, week long conference carbon neutral. It's a great marketing tool for all their promotional materials. Uh, and then there's also this, um, I, I guess, conflict with the fact that we do have this upcoming carbon neutrality goal. So we're not jealously guarding our offsets, but we do want to bank as many as we can ahead of 2024. Uh, but if we could get some additional promotional value by using small quantities of offsets, I think that's something we might want to explore. Thank you. Mick, you had. Uh, we have not offered them as incentives, but we've considered things like could we do a roundup program at the, uh, at the cashier at the, at the pod or the, the market? where somebody could round up and, and donate that money toward carbon offsets. So we've essentially calculated that uh, every ASU community member is responsible for about three tons of carbon per year. Uh, and so it wouldn't be that much money to uh, maybe ask them to donate or you know use programs like this, like a roundup program to essentially contribute toward uh, eliminating their contribution to ASU's carbon footprint. So almost kind of the the reverse of, uh, you know, how can we get them to participate in covering their portion of the university's footprint? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I have so lot, so many questions myself. Um, also, I would be curious: How do you communicate the carbon offset program to your students and the wider campus? Do you tell them what you're doing, or do you just do it, Dave? Yeah, we don't do it well, and we should do more of it because one of the as I indicated, one of the primary goals of our offsetting program, again, uh, is to socialize uh, those offsets by providing a social benefit to underrepresented groups and communities, and then leverage that by communicating that uh, engagement with uh, those communities as part of our diversity, inclusion, and um, anti-racism, frankly. Uh, programs and really try to uh, put a face on offsets, uh, not just having about counting carbon beams, but about delivering benefits for people. So the revenues that go to the nation, obviously uh, sorely needed. Uh, the uh, uh, solar thermal projects that we put on uh, low-income housing in Loveland, uh, Colorado, uh, great. That wouldn't happen without that, and we're helping folks uh, with that. Um, solar that we put on schools. Uh, we did a methane, a landfill methane to a brick kiln project for a few years, uh, which similar to the methane recovery that Ian and I have been touting was measurable, had a meter and a button that, you know, switched from pipeline to landfill methane and went to the brick kiln and, and the brick kiln employed in this small town, um, preponderance of low-income, underrepresented type people of color and so forth. So there was a strong social connection. We've tried to communicate that as the broader social benefits, offsetting the social cost of carbon, not just the environmental cost of carbon, but talk about the social cost of carbon and, and make it a bigger, more personal connection. And that's, I think, our goal really is to highlight that in the cases where we're going to use offsets which are here for at least the short term, um, but long term, I agree with everyone else. That's it's our last, our last hope. Good, I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Ian. Can you say something about communication as well, since your campus has achieved? Yeah, so uh, and, I, and I think you know that that kind of that that moment in the limelight has helped us with that uh, with that communication effort. It it, uh, it gave us that that moment to to talk about it, but it is. It's a difficult thing to communicate. Um, this is not, you know, an easily understood mechanism. Carbon accounting is a very specialized um, field. This is a very enigmatic type of thing to, to talk about. You know, we're not talking about tangible things that you can see and touch and feel, and, and it's kind of out there in the ether um, in a lot of ways. And so that's a difficult you thing. You can see the trees. You can see the trees at least. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. Uh, and that, and and when we survey students, um, those those sorts of offset projects end up being some of the some of the most preferential ones because you can see them. Um, incidentally, those tend to be um, some of the most problematic unless they're, they're very closely monitored as well. 
Um, and so it's it's something you know we've we've tried to to put it in a context that is easily understood. We've developed um, some some interactive graphics and things that help um, help with the communication aspect of this. But I, I will readily admit that this is uh, this is a difficult thing to to talk about. And and I think the the easier side of that to discuss are the things that Dave has talked about, the co benefits, the other the other benefits that. Um, this effort is having, um, you know, in our region on the climate with with uh, marginalized communities, um, and then also to talk about, you know, our role uh, and communicate. Uh, it's it's easy to see this um, as as uh, as a cop out, as as a buyout, right? Uh, we're just buying our way out of this, and and so communicating certainly uh, first that we've that we've really tried to do the hard work first before we've gone down this road, and that that work does continue. Um, that that we're. Uh, you know, eventually trying to work ourselves out of a job, although I think there are certainly <laughs> uh, plenty of caveats to that. Um, but then also our role and our responsibility in higher ed is, uh, as I've mentioned a few times, in uh, in developing these these technologies, these markets, supporting those. Um, and I, I think that is um, a message that that resonates and is uh, is is an easy one to easier one to communicate and understand as well. Yeah, great. Thank you. This kind of leads me to one of the audience questions that I would like to ask you. Purchasing offsets is so much less expensive than doing the infrastructure projects that reduce emissions directly on campus. In your opinion, is it better to purchase offsets that cover all of a college's natural gas consumption or instead put that money toward projects that would directly reduce emissions, but only a fraction of them? Yeah, Ian, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I just jump on this one, uh, raise my hand quickly, because I think this is one that that we deal with, and I'm sure uh, the, the rest of the folks in the panel do as well regularly. Um, I would I would push back on that a little bit. Um, the idea that it's less expensive, I think the first cost, the image of the first cost is maybe less expensive, um, but that is a continual um, and, and perpetual financial liability that you have to buy year and year and year over. Um, and, you know, uh, as, as we look at some of the infrastructure projects that we have done, some of them um, are, are exceedingly affordable. Um, they're not shiny, exciting projects necessarily, but LED lighting conversions pay for themselves uh, oftentimes inside of a year. And so we've been able to shift that year's um, utility budget into uh, some of those infrastructure and lighting projects and, it, and without even having to find new, new monies. Um, at the same time, you know, some of the other the other projects we're in the in the process right now of um, replacing a dishwasher um, that that uh, the, the commercial dishwasher and that will allow us to, to lower the central uh, heating plant, the high temperature hot water loop, um, which saves us um, in the neighborhood of about $40,000 a year. And so the payoff on that project um, is is inside of three years. And so first cost wise, this appears to be uh, less expensive because Depending on where you look, offsets are anywhere from three-ish to twenty dollars a ton, um, and and so you can you can offset things very, very inexpensively um, out of the gates. But that adds up over time, and you know over over the last since we started this since two thousand eight, um, our actual savings when you when you consider all the mo the money that we put into the infrastructure projects to get to that that large decrease um, in emissions. We've saved um, in the neighborhood of about seven and a half million dollars, and so I, I think, um, you know, there's there's there is some uh, uh, certainly some savings, and and you know there are there are remaining emissions, and some of those are more expensive to um, to address to deal with. But I, I I think there's a balance to be had here for sure. Great, I appreciate that, Dave. Yeah, I think there's. I have three sort of reasons that we do this. First of all, I think we should do both because, oh, by the way, the end game is to reduce um, carbon emissions in, in the atmosphere. The atmosphere doesn't care what our reasoning is for cutting. Uh, it just doesn't care. And so everything we can do to cut those emissions is a good thing to do. Secondly, as we've discussed, um, you know, repowering to LEDs in my closet doesn't help underrepresented communities. So the social benefits of offsets, if we're smart about it, can provide a much broader buy-in to the entire process of moving towards carbon neutrality and so forth. And then third, I can threaten my administrators with, we're going to have to buy these forever unless you guys fund the damn projects we need done. And you know, I hope this offset bill is killing you. Uh, we can make it go away. Let's just do something over here with renewables or whatever it is. 
and they go oh, yeah, yeah we're gonna be addicted to these things forever yeah yeah so um yeah that's that's my approach is you know point out the good things and then threaten them with the bad part thank you do either matthew or mick have a comment on this well i would agree it's it's actually not very easy to have somebody write a check that just it's considered to be going out the door versus you know investing in the campus and so, um, uh, yeah, you need to, and the, the idea that you're gonna be writing that check every year is, uh, is, is a, actually an incentive to do stuff internally. So we've done, uh, we've done over a hundred million dollars of energy efficiency retrofits uh, on campuses and we have 90 plus solar arrays plus some offsite utility scale stuff. Um, that's going to be, that's going to remain the priority. Actually getting into carbon offsets was a challenge because it required quite a bit of education and, and uh, this idea that we were investing in something that was going to be away from campus. Um, and so, um, so I, I would agree that, I mean, you, you, need to, you need to do the heavy lifting uh, internally and that's going to be a long lasting investment. Uh, so yeah, the LED lighting less than a year. Controls have been something that we've had a little bit of a hard time on payoffs, but now those prices have been coming down so we can do that. But you know, our next big step is more, you know, multiple hundreds of millions of dollars um, if we're gonna do it and, uh, you know, eliminate the need for uh, carbon offsets altogether. But we actually have a sustainability initiatives revolving fund that has about $39 million in it that we invest in projects on campus and they have a required rate of return hurdle. Um, and so we've actually, you know, we're starting to add the price of carbon offsets into uh, the financial analysis of those projects. Because if you don't do that, or if you do that project, that's fewer offsets that you're gonna need to buy and fewer recs that you're gonna need to buy. And so that actually get, plays into the financial analysis for on-campus projects. Okay, great, thank you. I think that's a really important financial um, characteristic of offsets that we need to highlight more in our discussions with CFOs and so forth. It, you know, CFOs love three to seven year ROI projects. They love those and, and they should. Uh, however, comma, if you don't do that, then you're gonna be buying offsets forever. That changes the ROI calculation dramatically. And so we're having this conversation now about geothermal ground source and so forth, which is notoriously high in terms of ROI unless somebody gives you a big check to buy it down. But you know, our, my argument back is, well, first of all, we're not selling these buildings in seven years and we're gonna be here a long time. Our oldest building is 150 years old. And secondly, if you don't buy it, you know, we've been directed by the Board of Regents to reduce our emissions to zero. And so we're going to buy offsets without them. So put that into your financial calculation and come back with, my, with what the ROI looks like. Instead, we can purchase the infrastructure we need to use renewables and so forth and make money. We save money. Those are cash dollars. Those are not soft costs. And that goes back into the bank. The, the revolving fund uh, that Mick's talking about, we've had uh, some experience with that. We had a small one. We're trying to get a much bigger one now, but the small one made 37% ROI. I mean, you know, you're not getting that on Wall Street. Can we do more of that? The way to think about this financially is really critical. And I really appreciate Mick pointing those arguments out because that is something that CFOs need to get trained into their commonly accepted uh, accounting principles. Yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have about five minutes left in this panel. There are probably lots more things to discuss. I would just like one short question to be answered from the, uh, the audience. Have your universities considered light pollution when installing efficient lighting systems? I don't know who to ask this question in particular or if it's even of any concern. Yeah, Ian, I saw you unmute. Uh, I was backing out for Mick, but uh, sure. Um, it, yes and no. Um, it's not something that is, has hit our, uh, our administration yet as, as critically important. Um, we have faculty that, that are really very into this um, and, and have joined, um, you know, local neighborhood groups and uh, particularly um, uh, some of our faculty in physics that are, that are uh, astronomers. Um, we, have a, we have a remote campus um, down in the San Luis Valley 
um, in Colorado that uh, that is is very much uh, a dark sky initiative uh, community. And so it exists on our campus, but it exists within certain um, populations, and 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 we have not. Um, to, to date been able to, to get uh, a Dark Skies Initiative commitment from the, the college as a whole yet. But I think that that discussion is happening. Okay, thank you. Maybe Most of our efficient lighting projects are actually retrofit. So we're not necessarily adding light where there wasn't light before. And, and most of them are occurring inside buildings. Yeah. Um, so it's really about uh, delivering that light much more efficiently than delivering more light. Okay. Great. Uh, given that we only have four more minutes left, I would like each of you of the panelists to uh, give a closing statement where you can maybe say in very few words what's the most important to consider about carbon offsets or, or what have you considered to be the most important in regard to your university. And I'm going to start with Ian. If you're on the top left of my screen. Got it. Okay. Um, you know, I think it's a lot of the, the things that we've covered already, right? I think it's, uh, for, for us, it's the necessity of these um, as part of a global solution. Um, it's the, it's the co-benefits and the verifiability of these, making sure that it has the impacts that, that uh, are being touted, right? Um, and so what's the traceability of that? How do we make sure that it has those? Um, and then I think to, to Dave's earlier point, you know, about, um, uh, you know, it, it takes both, it's infrastructure and, uh, and offsets, and it, it takes both. Um, you know, as he said, the atmosphere doesn't care. Um, and to some extent, it doesn't care that, that I, our comp campus has reduced, you know, close to 40,000 uh, tons, right? The global picture is still very dire. And so I think, um, I, I feel that it's incumbent upon us to, to expand beyond our own campuses and, and, um, and work with developers um, and, and other, other um, businesses, um, not only on, on you know, managing their own carbon reduction, but also in developing some of these other solutions and other projects. So I think it's it's keeping that kind of um, all of the above strategy in, in full view and, and really um, being cognizant of what our role is, not only on our own campuses, but within the greater society as well. Yeah, thank you. Great. Matthew, your closing statement. Sure. I mean, if we're talking uh, globally, I, I think uh, additionality, uh, as complicated as it can get, as, as quickly as it can get, uh, is difficult to uh, conceptualize sometimes. If you develop your own project, um, you have much more control over the additionality of your project, a uh, much higher comfort level with that additionality compared to going to market. Um, but yeah, I, I would say, think very carefully about the additionality of any project you're interested in, even if it's on some of our favorite registries or being sold by some of our favorite brokers or uh, marketers. Um, if the project isn't additional, we're lining someone's pocket for not much of a benefit. And I think we could all uh, agree that that's something we want to avoid. And, uh, you know, even if it's on your favorite registry, I would still say do your own due diligence. We have great resources on our campuses to help with that. And the more comfortable we can be with the offsets we purchase, the more comfortable we are marketing it, raising funds for future purchases and, and helping us along towards our goals. Great. Thank you. Nick? Uh, I would say that it's very, very complicated. Uh, I'm not actually an expert in this. Corey on my team, I tasked to become the expert. Um, and he's done that. It's taken him four or five years to just become a kind of a master of this. And yet there's still, the, the field is constantly evolving. And so there's new stuff to learn all the time. And the additionality question is this perpetual question um, and it depends a little bit on scale too as to what you're talking about. But I would say one of the most frustrating parts of all this is that the price of offsets varies so widely. Um, and some of this is because we don't actually have a, a, a regulatory regime around it. We don't have a national policy on it. So it would really help to have, uh, in my mind, to have a national price on carbon and actually have a more formal market for this. Um, but it's really hard to justify um, a, a, you know, a, let's say a tree planting project um, that has lots of different co-benefits. That's fantastic. But if it's 10 or 15 bucks a ton and you can go out on the market and buy offsets for a buck, um, it's very, very, that's a very uphill climb to make. Uh, but, you know, the, the, it's really important. So I think what Matthew's talking about, developing your own projects and having those co-benefits 
and maximizing those co-benefits because it's going to cost you more. Uh, but if it's advancing the mission of the university, it's an investment. It's just an investment across silos. So, um, so I would encourage that. Go for that as much as you can. But you know, this idea that there's there's offsets out there on the market for very cheap is going to make it a, a difficult sell. Good point. Thank you. And Dave, your last word. Thank you. And very briefly, you know, my long game, and I can't say it's the university's long game, but my long game is to uh, do away with offsets and, but not do away with the social benefits and to get to the same end game by building infrastructure that provides services and benefits for both the campus and the community. An example we're looking at now is how can we fund solar gardens and or rooftops on low income homes in our communities? The communities get the low um, uh, power purchase agreements and so forth. They get the green power, uh, but we get the wrecks, so we can take them off. So we effectively have an offset that way. We repower our community through distributed renewables, as well as on-campus renewables, which are much harder, as all my colleagues know, I'm sure. But find a way. We've already done that with water. We funded uh, water um, infrastructure upgrades in low-income homes throughout uh, the Boulder community through our local housing authority. And again, those residents get uh, you know cheaper water bills and so forth. We claim those water savings against our water consumption. So sort of modeling how we could do that. I think there's many more innovative ways. And my hats off to, to Matt, Ian, and Mick for pioneering some of these processes on their campuses. I want to rob and steal everything that they thought of and see if we can you know build it in, in Boulder. Uh, nothing like following the leader. Great. Thank you all so much. We are. Uh just a few minutes beyond the time we were allocated. Thank you all for participating. I really appreciated your answers and thoughts into this. And hopefully we motivated some other universities to be active in this field as well. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.